But we've got living on a prayer. And this idea of living on a prayer, the song sort of talks about how life is difficult, how life is struggle. But there can be a hope in that struggle. And there's this beautiful line that we're going to get to in a moment. But it's all about just love. Taking a shot on love. Like love can make us do crazy things. I don't know about you, whether it's from a family member, a spouse, a parent. Because you love them, Sometimes it makes us do crazy things. Maybe they suggest something. Maybe they say, this would be amazing. And you're like, I would never do that. But because you love them, you decide, I want to keep them happy. I want to please them. Maybe I want to win some brownie points. You could end up doing anything because of love. And maybe you have your own stories of crazy things that you've had to do because someone you love has asked you to do it. But there's this amazing line just before we get to the chorus in Living on a Prayer. And it says, for love... We'll give it a shot. And today, that's what I want to ask of you today. Why not give it a shot? Why not give this faith thing a shot? Why not give God a shot? Maybe you've had a great upbringing. Life has been easy. Maybe it's the opposite. Things haven't gone your way. The past was difficult. And you've been journeying on life. And you've give certain things a shot. I'll try this. I'll give it a shot. I'll date this person. I'll give it a shot. And we try and try all these different things to try and find peace, satisfaction, hope, a future. Like we all try these different things to try and find our way to the future. But I believe that nothing else satisfies. So my challenge for you today is why not give this faith thing a shot and consider the possibility of living life with God, by God, and for God. Because as normal human beings, we are normally selfish. Like, it's natural. We want what we want. I want the things the way I want them to be. And we live with myself, by myself, for myself. We think the whole universe sometimes surrounds us. It's all about me, me, me. But I want you to consider the possibility of living life with God, by God, and for God. So today's message is going to be simple. It's going to be a short idea. And it's literally, we're going to name it all after the lyrics. For for love, we'll give it a shot. So what would you do for love? We'll give it a shot. But this love that I want to bring to you today is not an ordinary love. Maybe it's a love that you've never experienced before if you're not a Christ follower. But it's the love of God. And I want to challenge you to just give it a shot and see where it takes you. And as we were planning and preparing of living on a prayer, that'd be a great um, song to kick our, our, our service off with. And the lyrics are great and we could preach on that. As we were putting all this together, just the other week, Bon Jovi made the news. And Bon Jovi's getting older, so he's making the news a lot less. But this time, Bon Jovi saved someone's life. So he was in Dallas and he was recording a music video on this bridge, his team and over there, and he was walking along, and just over here, you see someone over the ledge getting ready to jump off. And he takes his time, he walks over, hey, how's it? some small talk, was able to embrace them, and then bring them safely over to safety. He was able to talk them down from jumping over. And it just tees up our series so well, because maybe you're not physically hanging over a ledge, but maybe you're hanging on to life. Maybe life has just been difficult. Maybe life has got away from you. Maybe you, like I know in my house, sometimes you just have a hold of things. Like you're on top of the washing. You're on top of the cleaning. You've paid all your bills. Like you feel like you've got it. And then sometimes life just gets away from you. You're getting a, a reminder. You, you, if you forgot to do this, you need to pay that. The washing and the ironing and everything. You haven't folded it and blah, 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 blah. Sometimes life just gets away from you. Or even more than that, maybe life is just fleeting and you're, you feel like you're just missing opportunities and you're not good enough and life is just too complicated to try 
and get your life around. So you just feel like you're hanging on to life. And you're not just living it, but you're just being dragged along by life. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe you feel lost, lonely, hurt, abandoned, scared, angry, betrayed, confused, dead inside. Maybe there's a lot of emotions going on within you. And life just feels like a drag. That one day you used to wake up excited for what the week could bring, excited for what this year could mean. And now you just feel like you're being dragged. That life is just uh, after blah. After just all these blah moments. And I have to do this and I have to do I have to pay this and work here and do that. And you feel like you're just being dragged by life. And all these feelings can be going on. And maybe you're pretending that all is okay. We can put a mask on and say, yeah, it's fine. It's not perfect, but I'll get on with it. But in reality, not everything is okay. All is not okay. And so often we're good at putting a mask on, pretending everything's fine. And in Ireland, it's small talk. It's literally, what's the crack? Nothing much. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine. And then you sort of walk on. So if we took everything at face value, everyone's, you're grand. Do you know, but we know that everyone isn't grand. We can put on a face, put on a mask, put on a show, but in reality, inside, everything's not okay. Things aren't going the way that you planned. You're hurt, lonely, lost, all these emotions. And this song, Living on a Prayer, captures this tension of how to have hope in the midst of struggle. Because life is difficult, life is hard, but life is better when there's hope. Like we've got something to look forward to. We've got hope in our lives. And that's the tension that we're trying to say. How can we have hope even though life doesn't go away? How can we have hope when I've been hurt? How can I have hope in any circumstance of life? And hopefully I can present that to you well today because we all struggle with different things. So we all have a struggle and we all want the hope inside that struggle. But what is your struggle? We all struggle with different things. Maybe it's something like patience. I'm sure we all struggle with something like patience. Why is everything in the world so slow? And when you need to be somewhere in a hurry, why does everything slow down? Like, what is that all about? Or maybe you struggle with procrastination and everything else looks so attractive except for the task that you're supposed to do. I remember when I was like in college and revising and other things, other things. I would never want to tidy my room except for when I had to revise. Because when you had to sit down and you were told to revise, everything else seemed a lot better. It was like, oh, I'll just, I'll do this drawer and then oh, I'll get back to that. And it's just, you're looking at everything else. But these are all very surface level. I know we have, oh, I struggle with patience and I wish things would move faster and procrastination. But there's some deeper issues that some of us struggle with as well. Maybe you struggle with identity. Maybe you just don't know who you are. You have a name, but you don't really feel it. You don't think you have a place. You feel lost anywhere you go. You try and fit in in different places, but you just feel like nothing has ever really clicked. Maybe you struggle with identity. Maybe you struggle with hurt. Maybe someone or something hurt you in the past and you're still holding on to it. And maybe it's become part of your identity now that you have associated it with who you are. And maybe you struggle with the idea of hurt, that someone has hurt you in the past, so people will continue to hurt you. Maybe you struggle with purpose. Why am I here? Why do I do the things that I do? Is there a higher purpose in life? Maybe you struggle with this idea that maybe life is all that you make it and everything that you can do. But what if there is an extraordinary purpose for your life? Or maybe you struggle with the past. Maybe something happened to you and it has affected your future. Maybe you struggle. How could I ever move on from what has happened? Maybe you struggle with a few of these things. Maybe you struggle with all of them, one of them. Maybe I didn't even name the thing that you're struggling with. But I want you to know today, even though I didn't name it, even though I didn't point it out, God knows your struggle. God knows what you're going through. And God wants to offer his help. God wants to intervene and say, I know your struggle. But he says this to you today, that 
I see you. God sees you today. In your hurt, in your pain, in your struggle, God says, I see you. So I might not have mentioned it. Maybe no one knows what's going on, but God wants to tell you today that I see you. I'm with you. I'm for you. And you're working on some things and you're struggling. But what if I told you that there was a better way? What if there is a better life? Then you don't have to be dragged by life. You don't have to continue the way that you've been going on for so long. What if there is a better way? And the question I want to answer today is what would it look like if we give God a shot? If we just said, God, do your thing. What have I got to lose? I've tried this. I've tried that. I've lost on this and I've lost on that. God, I'm going to give you a shot. I've never thought about it before. Sounds like a good idea. I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but what would it look like if we would give God a shot? And as a Christ follower, I believe we can find our answers in the Bible. That the Bible isn't just an old text that we have to read because it's a religious text. But actually, we read the Bible because it is helpful and hopeful to us. It's not just pie in the sky, I'll read it and I'll encourage you and you'll feel better. But actually, it's helpful in our lives as well. So I hope this message is helpful and hopeful to you. And I think one of my gifts is that I am simple, so I preach simple messages. So I think this is going to be easy to understand, easy to apply to your life. It's a gift that if I'm simple, and if I understand the message, that all of us should be able to understand the message. So hopefully you can take this home, work on it, and be like, Do you know what? I, I'm going to give God a shot because I've tried it all and nothing seems to be working. So I'm going to give him a shot. And we're going to read a passage in John chapter 10, verse 10 to 15. And John is one of the four gospels in the Bible. So there's four books at the start of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. My favorite is obviously Matthew. Um, and when I was younger in my Bible, everywhere it said Matthew, I put Francie. <laughs> Which I probably shouldn't have looking back. Uh, but it's done now and I'm forgiven. But, um, so he's one of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And gospel simply means good news. And sometimes for some people that just reframes everything. It's no longer just a book of the Bible. It's no longer just this text, but actually it's good news. So it's John's version of good news. John's version of good news is that Jesus is alive. Jesus loves you and he died to save you. And that is good news for me, good news for you, good news for us all. So John wrote one of these gospels, which literally meaning good news. He wanted to tell everyone about this good news. Just as when we have a good news story, we want to tell people. John wanted to write down all the good news that Jesus provides. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're writing to make it a historical sort of, this is what happened. This is what Jesus said and did. So we can look back and see everything that Jesus said and done. And all its accuracy, we can see everything that happened. But John focused more on who Jesus is. So for John, it was important that what Jesus said and done. But his higher importance was he focused more on who Jesus is. He's not just this far off God. He's not just a name on a page. He's not just a stained glass window. But when we read John's Gospels, we see who Jesus is. And one way John does that is he includes seven I am statements. So in this book, John records Jesus saying, I am blank seven times, which gives us a great insight about who Jesus is. And if you've ever dated in your life, you will know this stage of the relationship. Just trying to find out as much as possible about the person that you're dating. Making sure they're not a weirdo, a psychopath. They're going to kill you one day. Hopefully they've got some money hidden away somewhere. Like we're trying to find in this dating stage, are we like, will this work out? Will we get together? And sometimes we find out it's not going to work. But a lot of the time, find out it works. So we find out more about Jesus because he says, I am. And we're going to look at one of those statements in a minute. But we're going to read John 10. But the chapter before in John 9, we see a physical and spiritual healing. So Jesus is asked, hey, I can't see by a blind guy. So he's like, you're healed. And we see this healing unfold. And then the religious leaders are like, 
who does he think he is? How can he do that? Who does, is, who's this Jesus guy? And then at the end, Jesus talks about spiritual blindness. That even though you see me, I'm a physical man, Jesus, in front of you, you don't see me as God. So they were spiritually blind to see what was going on in front of their own faces. And Jesus revealed himself to someone and he said, I can now see in a spiritual sense. So we see a physical and a spiritual healing. And that's my prayer for you today, that even though you can see physically, maybe you're spiritually blind and that God would open your eyes today to see who he really is. And as we start John chapter 10, it starts with the religious leaders that were also in John 9 debating who Jesus is. It's like, who does this guy think he is? He's claiming he's God. He's claiming he can do this. He just healed a guy. Like, who is this guy? So John continues in the phrase or in the passage that we're just about to read. And we read one of the I am statements. And Jesus is just telling him, this is who I am plainly and openly. So John says this, starting in verse 10. He says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I, Jesus, have come that you may have, everyone say life, and have it to the full. Everyone say full, life to the full. And maybe you don't know this, but you have an enemy. Maybe you have sensed that. Maybe you have like this unwritten enemy. Maybe someone who keeps stealing your seat in the office. Maybe it's the guy who gets on the bus first and you've just started this beef with them that they don't know about, but it's all internal in your head. But maybe, do you know that you actually have an enemy? A thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is this thief? The thief is the devil. And he doesn't want anything good for you. He wants you to be hopeless. He wants to cause you harm. He doesn't want you to prosper in any way. So this thief, this enemy that we have, he comes to steal. He wants to steal goodness from your life. He wants to steal hope from your life. He wants to steal peace. He wants to steal from you. He also wants to kill. He wants to kill the joy in your life, kill the promises in your life. And then he wants to destroy. He wants to destroy your present. He wants to destroy your future. He wants to destroy your life. So the devil is coming in to steal, kill, and destroy. And then we see this turning point when Jesus says, well, that's one side of life. But he flips it around and says, I, Jesus, have come that you. Now, this isn't just written to the people at that time that, oh, this is for you. And maybe you've written yourself off. Maybe you're not of faith and you think, I'm too far away from God. I'm not perfect. I don't know anything about this. And you've written yourself off. I want you to know that Jesus has come for you. Yes, you. Even though you've written yourself off, God sent us on Jesus for you. So that he could have a relationship with you. That you could experience life and life to the full. So Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life to the full. And we, we know this to be true, that life looks amazing in Hollywood. Our influencers online make life look amazing. I can travel around the world, I can buy this, I can do that, and it looks so picture perfect. But we know life isn't, life, isn't like that. So what does it mean for Jesus to give us life and life to the full? Another translation says abundant life. What does an abundance of life look like? That God wants to bless you. God wants an abundance of goodness in your life, an abundance of grace in your life, an abundance of just God working in your life. And so often, maybe as Christ followers, or if you're not a Christ follower, maybe you think, well, this life that they're talking about, they're talking about heaven. It starts when you die. But I want to break that myth that life and life to the full starts as soon as you put your trust and faith in Jesus. That you don't need to wait till you're dead. Yes, heaven is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be a great place. But life to the full starts here. God wants to give you abundant life here on earth. And I'm sorry if you've ever met a Christian who makes that look difficult. That we should, as Christ followers, we have life and life to the full. God has given us so much. And yet some of us walk around like, oh, oh. And God has blessed us so much. So you 
can experience life and life to the full and you don't need to wait for it. John goes on in verse 11 and 13 and Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. So we see these two sides, these two characters. We see the good shepherd and we see the hired hand. And Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? A shepherd protects his flock. He looks after the flock. He leads his flock. So as Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, what that means for us is that he will guard us, he will protect us, and he will lead us. Just like a shepherd with a sheep, God would do that for you as well. And the, a good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep, that when danger comes, he would lay it down. But we see that the hard hand doesn't. The hard hand abandons the sheep. I want you to know that God won't abandon you. God will never leave you or forsake you. In your toughest times, God won't let you down. He won't abandon you. So we see this between the shepherd and the hired hand. And when it's the shepherd, it's the shepherd's sheep. He owns them. He looks after them. So he takes more care than the hired hand. And it's the same for you. God, our creator, who created me and created you, cares more about you than anyone else. Maybe your friends and your family, your colleagues, they love you. But this love from our creator is so much more than those people that love you on earth. So it's this difference between the shepherd who owns the sheep and loves the sheep and the hired hands. God, our creator, knows us and loves us. And he won't abandon us when life gets tough. Maybe you've had friends in your life or family in your life. When it gets tough, they're nowhere to be seen. When it gets tough, they're like, oh, here, here. And they move on. But God will never abandon you. Never. A promise after promise, God will never abandon you. And I say it like this when I was reading this passage and the good shepherd has the sheep and it's the hired hand. I remembered when I got my first iPod touch. Does anyone remember the iPod touches coming out? And before that, like the screens were tiny. So this was the first one with like a big screen. And I remember having like, I had an iPod Nano and the screen was like this big. And then you had an iPod Classic and it was a little bit bigger. But what was crazy was we used to watch full movies on a screen this big. Like, that was just mental. And then they got the iPod Touch and it got a little bit bigger. But one day I was messing about and I dropped my, my iPod. I'm even struggling to say iPod because I haven't said iPod in years. I keep going to say iPhone. So my iPod is falling out of my hand. And maybe you've had this experience before. It goes in slow motion. And then all of a sudden it just starts to turn. And the glass hits the ground. And it's like, why can it not be like a cat? The cat always lands the right way up. Why can't my phone or iPod just land the opposite way of the screen? So I picked it up. It was shattered. I was like, what am I going to do? I was messing about. How did I tell my dad's story? So I got home, told him the story. He wasn't very happy. But he said this line. He says, you don't care about this because you didn't pay for it. You didn't have to do the overtime. You didn't have to sacrifice takeaways on the weekend. You didn't have to give so that you don't care about it. And when I thought about it, when you own something, you take far much more care than if someone else owned it. Like if I own my car, yeah, no problem. I'll make sure it's safe. If you have a rental car, they're the fastest cars in the world. You do not care about the fuel efficiency. You do not care about the top. You don't care about anything. It's not your car. You will do whatever you want in that car. And it's the same with my iPod. My dad bought it for me. My dad fixed the screen for me. And for me, I just received it. And you better, better believe it now. I pay for my own phone. So I have the best screen protector that you can buy. I have a full 360 degree um, case on it so that if it falls, it pretty much bounces up again. Because I would be the one to have to replace it. 
So now that I have paid for it, now that I own it, I care for it so much more. And this is what John is trying to get at and Jesus is trying to get at, that he created you, he loves you, so he cares much more about you than anyone else could. Because he created you and knows you, his love doesn't compare. His love is so much more than anything that you could experience here on earth. So I want you to know that he is the good shepherd. He'll never abandon you or give you up. And he goes on in verse 14 and 15. Jesus says again, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I love that, that yes, it's the, he's a good shepherd and we looked at that. But he says, I know my sheep. Like he knows us. And I want you to know today that he knows you. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows those things that you're struggling with. He knows the things that you hide from everyone else. But Jesus says to you today, I know you. I see that. I see the hurt. I see the pain. I see the things that you try to hide. And I still love you. I still want a relationship with you. I still want you to come close to me. Jesus says, I know you. He knows you. And sometimes that frightens us. It's like, God knows everything. Yeah. And he's still crazy enough to love you. And I love how he puts it. I know my sheep. But also says, my sheep know me. We have this amazing relationship with God that we can pray anytime, anywhere and communicate with him. But we're also given his word that he can communicate with us and we can learn what he is like. We can learn to recognize his voice and he puts people around us so that we can grow to be more like him. So Jesus isn't just some, like a name on the page, a stained glass window. He is someone that you can know. He's someone that you can have a relationship with. Just like you're dating and you find out about people, you can get to know Jesus. And yes, your relationship when you're first starting dating isn't perfect because you still don't know a lot about them. But it's just like our relationship with Jesus. You don't need to know everything straight away. You don't need to be like, oh, I'll wait until I know the answer to this. And I need to I know that. It's a relationship that continues to build and continues to grow. So you can journey along life getting to know Jesus more. So with all that in mind and all that Jesus said and John wrote down, Let's answer this question. What would it look like to give God a shot? To give the good shepherd a shot? The creator of heaven and earth, why not give him a shot? The person that knows me and I can get to know him, why not give him a shot? Why should I do that? And there's three things that I'm going to bring to you today. And they're things that Jesus, when he's part of your life, you receive. So we receive so much, but I'm going to focus on three things. There's benefits to being a Christ follower. And we don't get into a relationship just for the benefits. Like I dated Anna, married Anna, because I love her. Yes, there's benefits to that, but I didn't, but I didn't marry her just for the benefits. And there's some great benefits because her parents own a holiday home. I married up. I wasn't to get, able to give her anything, so I know that she married me for love. I don't have much to offer. But for her, when I married her, I married her out of love, but there's benefits. I got things like that and a great family, and, but we never do it for the benefits. But I want you to know when you give your life to Jesus, there are benefits. It is a great life. He gives you life and life to the full. But when you have a relationship with Jesus, if you give God a shot, there's hope. There is hope available for you if you give him a shot. And hope isn't this just abstract idea, airy-fairy. Oh, I hope this will happen or I'll dream about this. Like it's not, it's, a, it's not a thing. It's not a place. It's not a career. But hope is a person. And we believe that that person is Jesus. When we discover Jesus, when we have a relationship with him, then we have hope. And when we have hope, anything is possible. And maybe you're here today and you've given up on hope. And you could be a Christ follower and given up hope or not a Christ follower and given up hope. That maybe the way you'd pictured life 
isn't the way life is at the minute. Maybe you'd hope for something. Maybe you'd put all your eggs in one basket and say, we're going to try so hard to go this way. It's just not working out. I've tried to open business after business after business. and I'm just giving up hope. I don't think there's a way through. And life is difficult. Just because we have life and life to the full doesn't mean our problems and difficulties and struggles will leave us. But it gives us hope, help, and healing for that. But this idea of giving up hope, maybe you're in that place today and it's, it's not just week after week. It's not much month after month. It's like year after year. And maybe you're in this room and you were like me and maybe you'd given up hope in a situation that you think it's too long now. Surely God can't move. And for me, I used to work as a children's pastor in Belfast and then we moved down here. So I loved working with kids. My wife, Anna, is a teacher. She loves working with kids as well. So from a young age, we'd always talked about having a family, having kids. And she works in a school. I worked with kids. And it was just like, we wanted to have kids. We want to have a family. And if I had my way, I would have had kids as soon as I turned a teenager. I just wanted a family. I was just like, come on, we'll do it. But I waited. Um, And we got married and we were like, okay, we'll have a plan. We'll wait this long and we'll, we'll travel and whatever and then we'll have a family and then we tried first month didn't uh, okay it's just the first month and then it was month after month I was like nothing's happening and then it was year after year and you're starting to think where is the hope in all this is this ever going to work out God you know that even in my job I love working with kids I love being an auntie and an uncle. But why is things not working out? And it just took year after year after year. And I was like, okay, I'm getting old now. I've nearly hit 30. Well, like at 30, we'll be like, okay, something is wrong. We'll need to work it all out. And it was just this point. I was like, where, where is the hope? How, are we, how can we go on? And so often... As Christ followers, we're so easy to just turn to friends, turn to place, turn to different things. And sometimes we forget about him. So when we turn to him, he gives us a hope and a future. And now I have a four-month-old baby. And God has given us hope. And if you have hope in your life and you've lost this hope that this thing started week after week, and now it's dragged into month after month, or maybe it is, year after year, and you still feel hopeless, why not give God a shot? He is the hope that you're looking for. Jesus is the hope of the world. And the challenge for you today is put your faith in him. Put your trust in him. Don't rely on the world. Don't rely on good advice. Put your trust and faith in Jesus because there is hope. There's also healing. God brings healing to us when we're hurt, we're dying, we're full of pain. God brings healing. And you know, you can live well. It's God's desire to see you live holy and healthy. God wants what's best for you. We've seen in John 10, the devil wants nothing good for you, but God wants everything good for you. And there's healing. Maybe things have happened in the past. Maybe you've got excess baggage. I was traveling at the start of this week, but it was just a one night trip. So it was a small bag and a backpack and it just felt so easy getting on and off the plane and whatever. But if you ever went on holiday and you've got your cross bag and you've got all your small bits and pieces in this bag, then you've got your backpack in case you lose the luggage and everything else in this. Then you've got your big hold all, then you've got your small suitcase and you're just walking through the airport and you're trying to drag it along. And then sometimes you think you're macho man and you're trying to please the wife. So you take her small suitcase too and you line everything up. So you grab two on this hand and the big one on this hand. You're still trying to gra- drag everything along. And then you get to your gate and you can just let it go. You can take off all the bags, take off all the... And that sense of... Oh, after a long day shopping, carrying all the groceries and it's just that... Oh, maybe today you have access baggage there's just so much that you're trying to carry 
in your life. I want you to know today that you don't need to carry it anymore. You don't need to carry it around. You don't need to struggle. And sometimes we like to carry things around. Look how strong I am. Oh, I can bear this burden. I can. Sometimes we like to show off a little bit. Look at my battle scar. Look at my wounds. But God says, you don't need to carry this baggage anymore. Just give it to me. So whatever you're carrying, whatever you're facing, I want to challenge you, let go and let God. And sometimes we don't like to let go because if we carry our luggage, well, then I'll know it definitely is going to get to where I need it to be. If I'm carrying all my baggage, well, then I can control how that works in my life. But if we let go, then we give him control. We put our trust and our faith in God. But then we need to let God. We need to let God do what he can do. And this, it feels like so simple. Just let go and let God. Why would I not give the creator of the heavens and the earth my problems? Why would I not give God everything? Because he knows me. He created us. He, he would protect me and never leaves me, never abandon me. And yet so often as Christ followers, we struggle to give it to God. Is God our first response or our last resort? I want to challenge you. Let go and let God. You don't need to leave this place the same. Maybe you've just, oh, that's the card I've been dealt. That's the way I'm going to live. That's the way life is. It's not, life doesn't have to be like that. You can receive life and life to the full with Jesus. So you can receive hope. You can receive healing. But also lastly, there is help. There is help available for you. God doesn't just, okay, you're a Christ follower now. You go live life. Your, yep, go on ahead. No, he lives with us and he helps us and he surrounds us with people to help us. A life of following Jesus is not to be lived alone. We're all created for community. And this is for the introverts as well. And I'm an introvert and sometimes we like to be left alone. But life is not supposed to be lived alone. We're created for community. To connect with one another, to chat to people. And we have a saying around here, it says, if you've had a bad week, you need people. And if you had a good week, people need you. And that's why we have connect groups because each and every day is different. Each and every week is different. If you've had a bad week, you need to get the connect group. You need to connect with people who will love you and encourage you. And if there's free food, even better. But if you've had a good week, you need to surround yourself with people. You can bring them up. You can encourage them. You could be the one that lifts someone else's spirit, and God can use you to speak into someone's life. So if you had a good or a bad week, we need people. We need to be surrounded by community. And we here at Lighthouse Church are a community. And this is just a small part of what we do. We love our services. We love gathering like this. But we find community is better when we're connected in a group. I can't possibly connect with a massive full room. But in a small group of 8 to 12 people, I can connect with those people. We are community here. And you can find help in community. We, all our volunteers, come really early to set up church. And every just before service, we give them some treats and coffee just to give them enough energy to get through the day. And we encourage them and we inspire them to serve. And today... Someone came and said, I joined a connect group and it changed my life. I just thought, oh, I'll go to a group. It'll be nice. It'll be good to hang out, get new friends. But she said it changed everything. God was able to bring people around her so that when she had prayer requests, when life was tough, they could surround her. When she was full of faith, she could pray for them. When she's had a good week, she can build up and encourage and connect with people. So you can find help in community. But if we could summarize this message and you could leave with one thing, I want this one statement. 
to be with you. And all that we do through the music, through the message, and through baptisms in a moment, I want you to remember this, that Jesus changes people's lives. Church is great. Community is great. But nothing changes lives like Jesus. Being connected to a church would be good for you. Being in a small group will be good for you, but nothing will change your life like Jesus. And the question I want to leave you with is, what will you do for love? This love that Jesus is offering you, what will you do? Will you give it a shot? Will you say, hey, this sounds too good to be true? Sounds like a really good sales pitch, but then there's going to be a but. In this case, there's not. God's love is exceedingly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. It's incredible. And I want you to imagine for a moment, what could Jesus do for you? What could he do in your life? He could take that pain, take that hurt, take that struggle, and replace it with hope, with healing, with help.